I always say like over the summer, there was this big brouhaha with, um, you know, the Joe Rogan and Elon Musk uh, got all involved with, which is that this, this new study confirms or says the universe is 26 billion years old. Oh, yeah. And I talked about this with Joe on his show, and it's really one guy who I know, he's a nice guy in Canada, and he came out with some model that seems to suggest that, yeah, in certain circumstances, you could you could have a universe that's older, it would be needed to be older in order to explain the properties of galaxies that are much, much younger or too young in a universe that's only 13 billion years old. And for people following out there, we basically go up the scale solar system, galaxy, universe. So yeah. he's looking at the whole shebang. Clusters of galaxies between yes. that and then the universe. Yes. So he was looking at really, as you look back in space, you're looking back in time. So light, mm. you, uh, the only good thing about, you know, the, using imperial units of feet and so forth is that light travels one foot every nanosecond. So I'm seeing you, you're three feet away. I'm seeing you not as you are instantaneously right now, I'm seeing you three nanoseconds ago. You look very young and very vital and very healthy, <laughs> um, but uh, but it's not instantaneous. So as you look back to the curtains behind you, those are six feet away. So it's six nanoseconds. You keep going, go past you know New Jersey, Manhattan, go all the way back to the the center of the Milky Way, go beyond the Milky Way, go to the local supercluster. Eventually, you're going to get back to where there's nothing in your way. No buildings, no planets, no asteroids, no galaxies. And there you're seeing back to when the earliest galaxies themselves are being formed, if they exist. Mm. And what, he, what this uh, Rajendra Gupta at University of Ottawa said was, well, based on my calculations, one person's calculations, you know, bolstered by, you know, he didn't make any errors or blunders, but he sort of came to the conclusion that the universe had to be much older. We'll talk about that later because that is okay. a, a, a proper controversy that we can discuss. Um, there are others that say the universe is infinitely old. So he's, even though it's twice the age of the accepted universe that Gupta has come up with, it's still a hell of a lot, you know, younger than an infinitely old universe that this other guy, Eric Lerner, had come up with about a year before that. I just don't know how you can, and and this is the total non-scientist take sitting on the sidelines, just yeah. looking at this from the broadest lens you can. I don't know how you can possibly date something that we have, like, we haven't reached the limits of our solar system let alone the galaxy, right? And there's obviously things that can go into how how physics works to say that we have things like galaxies and, and there are collections of galaxies to form the collection of galaxies in the universe. But like to talk about the entire thing, which could be infinite numerical values away from us and to put a, to put a, a finite age on it, it, that does not process for me. Yeah, well, I can't. I just want to correct you with my you know, trademark love and affection. Uh, <laughs> it can't be infinite if the universe is not infinitely old. Yes. Okay. Sorry. But there are people, not necessarily the highest respected scientists out there, um, even working as professional researchers, just kind of pundits almost, that do say the universe is infinitely old and is static and has never changed. Mm. There is abundant evidence that the universe is not infinitely old and infinitely static and infinitely unchanging. But they're, to give them their due, they're in good company. I mean, Einstein believed until 1929 that the universe was static, effectively static. And in fact, he injected into mm. his famous equations a term that would counteract the gravitational collapse that he knew as a brilliant man would be inevitable for a universe that only has matter. So I, I told you before, protons repel each other. A proton and an electron attract each other because they're opposite charges. There's no such thing as negative gravitational charge. In other words, gravity is only attractive. In our solar system, there's no gravitational repulsion. There's no like antimatter that causes antigravity. Right, it doesn't push you. Yeah. Right? So, um, so Einstein then realized, well, I'm pretty smart. I know we live in a galaxy. Galaxy is made of stars and gas and dust and planets. Um, that's matter. That's only attractive. How come it's not collapsing in on itself? How come I'm here to ask the question mm. of why is there a galaxy at all? So he injected into his equations of what's called general relativity, which corrected the flaws in Newton's gravity in the same process of going from flat earth to spherical earth to pear-shaped earth, et cetera. That process is one of refinement. You mm. start off with an idea, you look for the flaws in it, then you look to find evidence and an explanation for why those flaws exist and how to correct them to make a better approximation, a more accurate approximation, and hopefully one that's more precise. So what Einstein did is he said, I'm gonna inject this fluid that fills the universe called the cosmological constant or the vacuum energy, and that's gonna act like the pressure inside of a balloon that keeps the universe expanded out against gravitational collapse of all the ordinary matter in the universe. And so he did that, later recanted it when he saw from Hubble 
that every single galaxy Hubble could see was moving away from the Milky Way galaxy. So at first, the very first thing he could say was, the universe is not static, right? Do you agree that in a universe where things are moving, that the universe is not static? Mm. Is that, I mean, I'm asking you. Yeah. Yeah, right. So that torpedoed a scientific idea that held sway for 2,000 years. Can I go back for one second just to make sure yeah. I, I didn't mix that up at the end? But when you were saying static, because there was a lot in there. Yeah. When you were saying static, he's referring to it didn't have necessarily beginning. It just always was. It, it, all, all I'm saying is static means that it's unchanging. It means that the only five things they knew that moved are the planets. They didn't okay. know about the other things that were moving in the universe up until, you know, Galileo and 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 uh, used the telescope. But you had said that Einstein, before he changed his opinion on this, had thought, you know, there wasn't like a beginning that had a creator. He certainly didn't think that. And yeah. then he when... didn't even think that there was something moving or expanding or collapsing. Remember, mm. with when you have when you have gravity. Uh, and you have this mysterious other force that could blow up the universe or cause it to contract slower or, or ultimately contract on itself. He wasn't thinking at all about uh, about the origin of the universe. That wasn't what was leading him. He was looking at the evidence. And the evidence showed that there are all these nebula, which they thought were outside or perhaps even inside the Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way galaxy wasn't collapsing in on itself. So forget about mm -hmm. these other galaxies for a second, although they're the crucial key insight that Hubble provided to Einstein to reject his original idea. But looking at uh, just the Milky Way galaxy, there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy, over 100 billion stars. They are not all collapsing together, even to the black hole at the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. What's causing them not to do that? Well, Einstein thought the universe was the Milky Way galaxy, and he said there must be some mm. force, some pressure that's keeping them perfectly balanced, which is very weird, right? Now, it turns out, Julian, let's blow your mind, it is true that there is a fluid <laughs> that does keep the universe um, inflated against collapse on itself, but it's doing too much uh, inflation. It's actually causing the universe to expand exponentially faster over time. So tomorrow's expansion rate, the galaxy that's at a certain distance away from us, is going to be farther tomorrow, and it's going to be accelerating away from us at a greater rate than it is today. But Einstein didn't know that back then. So you know, I, to be honest with you, I've I've committed the ultimate you know podcaster you know cardinal sin. So I don't remember what got us on the subject, <laughs> but just to say that um, in gravity with these unification, you know, back going back to string theory, perhaps that's what we were doing. We were doing string theory. The ultimate goal would be to explain. Why is the universe expanding like this? Why are the ultimate uh, building blocks of nature, the very smallest things in nature that we know about, why are they um, uh, responsible for the large scale behavior of the universe? And you mentioned, um, I think, which did get me on this tangent, it's incomprehensible. How do we even know the universe? We haven't only gone to the, you know, we've only sent people to the moon. Like, how are we, how can we say something about a galaxy that's 100 billion light years away um, uh, or less than that? But, the point is, is that in, in science, you have to do the following. You have to have a, some idea of the current best guess for the composition and dynamics of the universe. And then you have to ask a question. What is it about the universe that I can predict um, will happen tomorrow based on the evidence today? Mm. And then using that same inductive framework, yesterday, if I was a scientist yesterday, knowing what I knew only yesterday and not today, what would I have predicted about the universe today? And then you keep iterating that process backwards to the past, into the future, and you ask, do I reach a terminus? Do I reach a point in which there is no way to go back further in time to the past or to the future? Which would point to creation. A big bang or an origin of time or, an, or a collapse of a previous universe into the raw constituents of our current universe. Mm. And all these models have had ideas from antiquity to today. I mean, I was reading about an Egyptian cosmology from the year 1000 BCE. That's basically a cyclical universe that comes in and out of existence. And, you know, and there are models that have been static, you know, Aristotle to Newton to Einstein believe the universe was static, unchanging. <laughs> and then the question is, given the evidence that you have today, can you falsify any of those narratives? Yes, we can falsify many, many hundreds of thousands of, of, of cosmogenies, origins, genesises of the universe, models for it. And what's left is a handful, a small handful. But we can't do that with string theory. We can't really say, well, based on the evidence, this is incompatible with string theory and it's compatible with geometric unity. So that when I do what I do, my job is to, again, not prove these brilliant men and women right it's to hopefully falsify yes. as many of them as possible.